Hey everyone, welcome to the Regulator Roundtable. I'm Jeremiah De Janeiro, Site Manager at Alamance Battleground. In this video series, I'm speaking with authors who have written about the regulator movement during their careers. To find out more from them about how the regulators figure into their own personal story and let them reflect on the legacies of the movement as we commemorate the 250th anniversary of the Battle of Alamance. Most of the historians I've talked to for this series have published books or articles on the regulators, but this is not the case for everyone. Many historians have covered the regulators at earlier stages of their career and gone on to specialize in other topics. Today, I'm talking with Dr. James Broomall, a, history, a historian of the Civil War era who wrote about the regulators as a graduate student at UNC Greensboro. His book, Private Confederacies, The Emotional Worlds of Southern Men as Citizens and Soldiers, was published in 2019 by UNC Press. Dr. Brumall is also director of the George Tyler Moore Center for the Study of the Civil War and is an associate professor of history at Shepherd University. Jim, thanks for joining me. It's great to see you. Yeah, likewise, and thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, and uh, I, I guess I should, um, in full disclosure, say that you know we go back uh, several years, and, and we're both uh, UNCG alums, um, and have talked about many things. But to my knowledge, I think this is the first time that we have talked about the regulators. That 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 could be so, which is unfortunate. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It's, I, I'm glad we finally got around to it. Yeah, it, it, it took a separation of states and, and many years uh, lapsing, but still, nonetheless, we'll get there eventually. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, you've you have gone pretty far away from the 18th century as a historian and have done some really significant work in the Civil War era. So I wonder if you could take us back uh, to when you were at UNC Greensboro and tell me a little bit about the, the decision process where you um, started looking into the regulators as a, a thesis topic. Sure. Um, you know, I, I was born in North Carolina, but I moved when I was very young. And so when I went back in my early 20s for graduate school, um, I, I really wanted to immerse myself in, in place, in, in the history of the area. And as you travel on the highway corridors, Hillsboro is one of those places that you almost immediately go to. Um, it's, you know, between Chapel Hill and, and, and Greensboro. I was going between the two places a lot for social life, but also, you know, archival trips. And, you know, I remember very distinctly pulling into Hillsboro and being captivated by the town and I remember seeing the, I guess they're state highway markers. And I think that was the first information that I had about the regulator movement. And from that point on, as I was looking toward thesis topics, um, admittedly, it took me a long time to sort of determine what I wanted to do. But, you know, I was fortunate. I had a network of friends, um, Ernie Dollar, of course, Dave Southern, uh, Chris Graham, you um, who were very invested in North Carolina history, and I kept coming back to that particular topic. Um, Dr. Carr's book, Breaking Loose Together, had profoundly influenced me. I was really taken by it, um, but I also thought that perhaps, you know, in a very small way with a master's thesis, I might be able to make some sort of contribution or say something different. And so that's how I sort of landed upon the topic. Um, but, you know, what I would say, and this is the importance of your site. Place is what compelled me. You know, I, I visited Hillsboro, I visited the Alamance battleground, and although I often talk about ideas, um, I'm very, Im I immerse myself in archival sources. Places always speak to me. And, and I, you know, I, I, I quite literally wrote large sections of the thesis in Hillsboro, um, down by the courthouse. Um, in, in one of the local coffee shops, you know, I, I just walk around the town a lot. And, you know, I think for, for your audiences who are obviously invested in place, I mean, I think these locations speak to us, you know, that's why they need to be preserved and that's why they need to be visited and, and, and they tell stories, you just have to sort of unpack them. And, and this particular story can be viewed to some extent, and then also in some instances has to be sort of um, uncovered through the archival sources. And so I, I started to play around with those two concepts. and. Eventually, after you know the difficult writing process and, and, and research process came out with the thesis in the end. 
Yeah, I definitely understand what you mean about that sense of place, especially in Hillsboro, um, just because, you know, the, the grid is still so, so much aligned with the Sautier map uh, from the 1760s. And, um, you know, there are some spots where you can really, you know, exactly where certain elements in the Hillsboro riot took place, where the destruction of Edmund Fanning's home took place. And, um, you know, I know every, anytime I get a chance to go to Hillsboro to do a tour, um, talking about the regulator riot in September of 1770. Uh, it's always a real treat and it's, it's something uh, special. Uh, mm -hmm. So you do a lot of writing around Hillsboro when you're working on your thesis. Um, at, at, do you remember when you first read about the Hillsboro riot, what your initial observations were? I mean, that became the centerpiece. And, and, and so that's what struck me the most. I was reading really deeply in material culture studies um, so I was interested in both architecture and artifacts, and there weren't necessarily a lot of artifacts, but the architectural piece was key. There's the courthouse that still survives, and there's the, the Fanning home that was destroyed. And, you know, those events in September of 1770 are what really compelled me. And so the thesis actually grew out of that month and, and that year, and I became interested in sort of, you know, the, the origins of the movement, um, the scholarship that had been done has been written on pretty extensively since really the 19th century. And so I saw an opportunity there um, that that's perhaps where I could, again, master's theses or relatively small limited documents, but nonetheless, I thought maybe that's where I could do something that may hadn't been done to date. And um, so it was really the destruction of Fanning's home that, that fascinated me, um, the actions in the courthouse by the regulators themselves, what that said more broadly about political protests in the 18th century, um, the restraints of it, but sometimes also the, the violence, um, how calculated and how symbolic, um, you know, their actions were in, in, you know, one instance, creating an effigy of Fanning with some of the clothing from his house, you know, um, which connects to all sorts of 1760s, 1770s protests, but it goes back, of course, to England and, and beyond. And, and so all those things really captivated my mind. And so I was reading very deeply, of course, in the 18th century literature, but I was also reading really deeply into material culture studies and about crowd behavior. Um, and, you know, I was just really taken by it. I mean, in some ways, I sort of mourned that I became a 19th century scholar. I still read really extensively in the 18th century for fun, which is maybe better. It's so it's just, um, you know, an advocation now as opposed to a vocation. Um, but it just is a period that really continues to captivate me. And, you know, I think when I take my family places, we often go to some more battlefields, of course, but we also try to go to a lot of 18th century sites. So yeah, um, as someone who has also transitioned between 19th and 18th century history, I, I can really see where you're coming from. Sometimes it feels like, you know, I, I sometimes paint the 19th century as slightly more dour, you know, it's, it's slightly more black and white, and uh, 18th century culture and life just feels like it's, you know, in, in bright technicolor sometimes. And um, yeah, you're right, I, I don't feel like you can have a good crowd action in the 18th century without having an effigy of someone. And you, you made a great um, a point in your thesis where you uh, compare what the regulators did in Hillsboro with what a pro Tryon, uh, pro Josiah Martin slightly uh, crowd in New Bern did uh, after the Battle of Alamance where they uh, put up effigies of uh, the publisher and a couple of writers for the Massachusetts spy who had been writing a bunch of anti Tryon pro regulator uh, articles and they really mm -hmm. raised the ire of the, the people in New Bern. Um, so I, I guess, you know, while we're on this topic of the 18th and the 19th centuries, um, you know, what, what do you see as the key differences between studying the 18th century and the 19th century as a historian? What, what, are, the, what are the benefits? What are the drawbacks to, to each one since you've done a little bit of both? Sure. I mean, I think in some ways the craft of the historian is a bit transcendent. I mean, although we specialize in certain things, we're also connected by interests like change over time. That's something that is, is very fundamental to what we do. Um, but, you know, for me, it had a lot to do with the evidentiary base. And so by the 19th century and the people that I look at, which are primarily middle and upper class, the literacy rates in the American South are incredibly high. The ones in the North are even higher. And the ones in New England are, you know, well above I think 95, 96%, whereas in the 18th century, literacy rates are going to vary. 
Um, enslaved populations, of course, by law, um, are prohibited from reading and writing, although we know, you know, many learn to surreptitiously. But even among um, white farmers, you know, the ability to sign one's name signals a degree of literacy, but the paper record and the paper trail is relatively abbreviated. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I think I was very interested in public documents associated with the regular movement, the advertisements that they posted, a lot of the newspaper correspondence, as well as the material record, simply because it doesn't the type of introspective letters I became interested in for the 19th century. Um, I think the other thing that I make note of, and I don't want to get us too far off course here, but I, I buy this argument, I think it's a really interesting argument that the, the historian Jan Lewis makes, where the ways in which both 18th and 19th century peoples considered themselves, wrote about themselves, thought about things like emotion, how they felt and expressed themselves, very dramatically. And she uses Thomas Jefferson as, as sort of her crux, and she goes from Jefferson's generation to his grandchildren. And in that period of time, concepts like emotional disclosure change dramatically. Diarists go from recording relatively sort of mundane factual events of the rhythms of everyday life, and there are exceptions, certainly, especially among the evangelicals in the 18th century, but by the 19th century, they're much more effusive, much more introspective, they interrogate feelings like melancholy and, and what they call the blues, depression. And so there's sort of this opening up in some ways of introspection, which I found, which I found really compelling, much more difficult with your 18th century actors, just because of the ways in which they, again, considered themselves and wrote about themselves and conceptualized notions of self. And, and, and so you have not only a limited evidentiary base, but you have a very different worldview. That said, the 18th century is what sparked my interest in things like material culture. You know, the, the centerpiece of my thesis was that attack on Hillsborough and, you know, all of the, the you know, the, the extended discussions of the stuff that was taken out of Fanning's home and spread across the lawn. And as we talked about the parading of the clothing through effigies and, you know, deconstructing this, what we think was probably a very substantial timber frame building. And so I became very invested in material culture. Civil War era historians to this day have invested very little time and energy pursuing that fascinating field. There's, there's one to date, one <laughs> book um, that's an edited collection done by Joan Cashin as a brilliant collection. And our mutual friend and colleague, Pierre Carmichael's in there going back to the UNCG days um, among many other scholars. But I mean, it's remarkable. There's an outpouring of literature in the 18th century on material culture studies going well back into the 1970s. Whereas in the 19th century, it's extremely limited. And so I think one of the most important ways in which I think about sort of the 19th century world has been entirely informed by my entry into the 18th century at this point, nearly 20 years ago. And, and, and so I take those lessons and I've tried to bring some of those sensibilities um, to my studies in the 19th century and my writing to the 19th century. Yeah, it's, uh, while you're on this topic talking about material culture, uh, I should also raise the, um, uh, the, some of the songs of Redknapp Howell uh, that talk about Edmund Fanning's coat laced with gold. You know, there, there is this preoccupation with how, how wealth buys stuff. And, uh, you know, uh, how in the case of Hillsborough, it seems like attacking property can be just as, can send just as bold a message as attacking the person themselves in the case of Fanning and then Fanning's home. Yeah, and, and, and you know, it's, it's a, and, and, you know, let's not mince words. There, there were violent attacks on people in the 18th century. I know you're not saying otherwise. Right. But I sometimes have to be careful because when I teach this, I really want to illustrate, well, in many cases, they're going to warn the inhabitants to flee. Then they destroy the object. But you look at something like tarring and feathering. I mean, this is a very brutal process that in some instances um, kills the people who are attacked. But there is a lot of this symbolic theater that is, is so part and parcel. And if you think about Hillsborough itself, you know, laid out on this very symmetrical grid. It's it's sort of plopped center in this incredibly rural area that's composed predominantly of, of farmers. Um, you know, it's the symbolic embodiment of the Eastern aristocracy. It's inhabited, at least in the minds of many of the regulators, by corrupt merchants, by corrupt politicians, Fanning, who's friends with Tryon. Um, it, it, and so it's sort of a manifestation of many of their fears may have uh, much of their anger and resentment. And again, we see that sort of bubble over in a spectacular way in the fall of 1770, where again, 
Fanning is attacked as he's as he's fleeing the courthouse, but it's ultimately his home that's that's going to be destroyed. And remarkably, you know, they they basically say if you're willing to make amends for all the money that you've you know, stolen, we'll help rebuild your home. <laughs> and and he says essentially, no, I have no interest in doing that. But I mean, that's remarkable too. You know, that there there are certain restraints that the crowds enact upon themselves. Because again, it is the symbolic action that they they want to ultimately speak the loudest, um, and it, it it it's threaded throughout. I think a lot of the the, the primary source uh, materials on the regular movement and and the lace on Fanning's coat's another prime example of that. It, it's it's a very different world, you know. Yeah. Social hierarchies are certainly always in place throughout, um, you know, the experience of the Americas. But in the 18th century in particular, they're manifested in such clear material ways where, you know, the, the cloth that one wears can in many ways speak volumes about one's socioeconomic status. The embellishments that one puts on one's clothing could be aspirational, but are often projections of attaining great wealth. And, and again, the fact that that one particular line, which is a memorable one that, you know, I, I recall is in there, I think, again, just very succinctly um, distills this broad cause and, and these competing ideologies into a, a material embodiment, a material form. Yeah. And so that was the kind of stuff that just, again, really compelled me. I want to go back to your introduction. Um, and uh, you've got a line where you say, observers and commentators, both within and beyond North Carolina, refashion the meanings of the regulation to support local concerns. So the way I took that was that the the story of the regulators gets um, it, it when it gets understood. There's certain things that are lost in translation, and then some people take the story of the regulators and they they change it to fit the the message that they're trying to tell. Um, is is that a fair assessment of what you were trying to say um, with that line, and then with a the thesis in general? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think I I think at that point. I was really interested in sort of representations through language, um, meaning and memory. Um, and, and so, and, and misunderstanding, you know, how, how is it that colonists seemingly, you know, all part of this, this broad empire um, working towards similar ends have this, series of very destructive acts, you know, in between 68 and, and, and 71, you know, how is there so much mutual misunderstanding of the other? Um, and I, I think I'm just really compelled by that. Um, is, is that something that you find to be particularly true of the regulators? Is this something that sort of transcends history? Do you, do you see similarities with those misunderstandings with other I mean, conflicts you, or movements that you've studied? Sure, and if you fast forward to the American Revolution again, you know, I think England is wildly unprepared for the colonial response after 1763. Um, I also think at the same time that only the most radical of radical revolutionaries ever really wanted to sever ties with England as of even 17, as late as 1774, 1775. You know, the majority wanted to find some sort of means of reconciliation. It's only the most radical elements, figures like Samuel Adams, that I think really sought uh, a severed independence. And, and again, um, a lot of talking sort of past one another though, right? And, and, and so I think there's a, just a profound degree to, of misunderstanding, but then I think more importantly too, and maybe this is what I was trying to get at as well in that, that statement is how we then think about the events later. I, I think it's interesting how different generations have, have dealt with their wartime experiences. Um, I haven't done any reading on, you know, how regulators sort of confronted themselves if there is any really profound, you know, source material on it. Do you there, I, can, I can tell you that I have not, I've been looking um, yeah. because it's a, a big question to me and we'll, we'll get into it with a, another question I've got about this, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the regulators face something very similar. Um, and I, maybe it's, as you know, that sort of lack of emotional, or I guess a different level of emotional intelligence 
uh, emotional literacy, uh, mm -hmm. where you're actually expressing your emotions uh, in written form. But the only thing I've really been able to find, I guess this speaks to how you know closed off you could potentially be in the 18th century, um, a, a regulator loyalist. So you know someone who loses at the Battle of Alamance and then supports the wrong side in the revolution. Um, in some sources, it's been uh, noted as potentially Jeremiah Field, who uh, was mm -hmm. uh, he was the spokesman for the regulators when they uh, burst into the courtroom in Hillsborough. Uh, right, right, yeah. yeah, so he says, um, and he's quoted um, by as saying, uh, I fought for my country and I fought for my king and I've been whipped both times. And like, that's it. That's, that's the extent of him considering, you know, the, his post-war experience. Well, you know, I, I had the privilege recently of um, serving on a dissertation committee um, for a grad student in the University of Delaware, who's now at the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia, Tyler Putnam. And um, he, he looks at three conflicts, the American Revolution, the Civil War, and World War I, and this concept of how do people process this experience of war. And, and this is his work, not mine, but what he finds for the American Revolution is that as you said, there, there, there aren't these long introspective entries about it. And he's really interested in particular about artifacts and what veterans tend to save in large numbers are things like canteens or knapsacks, which they never had in civilian life. And so these, these sort of trappings of war, the material, that's what really intrigues them. Nothing that's terribly sort of violent, nothing that um, is associated with killing. It's the things that were part and parcel of their wartime experiences, not battle, their wartime experiences, camp and campaign. Those are the things that they saved, sought to pass on to their grand grandchildren. Whereas if you get to the war, the Civil War era, you see veterans saving battle scarred pieces of wood, saving huge numbers of bullets and shells, things that were, you know, encountered on the battlefield. They certainly are interested in the materiality too, um, the material of war knapsacks, tents, uniforms, but there's a, I think, a, a degree to which things have been touched by battle are the ones that become most sacred. If you think about Oliver Wendell Holmes, the future justice of the Supreme Court, you know, he saves the mini ball that he's hit with in the West Woods at the Battle of Antietam his entire life. He saves his bloodstained uniform his entire life. And there are no really comparisons in the 18th century. Now, granted, there is a higher likelihood that said items won't survive because of the passage of time. But nonetheless, that's saying something about two very different orientations, two different, two very different um, sort of worldviews. And, you know, again, this is all um, Tyler Putnam's work. And uh, Tyler now is the, uh, I think like the interpretation and gal the gallery manager. The, yeah, up at the, at the yeah, Museum of no Philadelphia. Lot. And, um, you know, I hope he, he ends up publishing portions of this in, in, in a journal or perhaps even a book, but it's a really interesting insight that a lot of people haven't thought about. And I guess this will tie back again to what you may have been pushing me to talk about is I think it's profoundly important to think across time. Like, you know, again, I, I think the ways in which I sort of operate as a scholar in the 19th century world, which is where I'm now firmly seated and feel the safest, were so much informed by my 18th century, you know, period. You know, in the the movement from 17, you know, say, let's call it 1768, when they first adopt that name regulators to 71 with the Battle of Alamance, that's its own thing. And historians have spent a lot of time trying to analyze what happened with that. But then there's this totally different uh, post-war and post-revolutionary war rebranding that happens with the regulators, wherein they almost flip. And if, you know, you went back to 1771 and spoke with the, or excuse me, um, if you go to 1775-76, as the revolution is starting, the people who are guiding the revolution in North Carolina, like Richard Caswell and Francis Nash, if you went and asked them what the regulators were all about, you would have gotten this picture of them being the villains of this conflict, you know, this mob that just would not follow the law. And then in the early 19th century, they become the heroes of the revolution. And um, it's not really the regulators that do that. Um, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about how that, how that process and why that process took place after the revolution in the early 19th century. And then um, maybe we can talk a little bit about how we can sort of push back on that. 
um, because it is ultimately not a true narrative to say that the regulators were the, the first revolutionaries just because their, their, um, their motives that didn't line up. Sure. And, you know, in, in many ways, it's more useful, of course, to draw parallels with the parallel movement in South Carolina, which had different causalities, different degrees of violence. Um, but, but that's really the sort of intellectual partner, I guess. Um, but no, I mean, I think it's, it's again, putting an event to a different, shaping the, the event to sort of suit your needs. And, and, and by the early 19th century, um, as lots and lots of memories of the American Revolution are, you know, being enacted across the landscape through the commemorative, through commemorations, through uh, monumentation, um, I think, you know, the event is very much framed around New England. It, it's very much a, a Boston, Massachusetts phenomenon um, in which you know, very slowly there are colonies come into being. At least I think that's part of the national narrative. I'm not saying that's true, but I think this perhaps maybe gave some North Carolinians a, a, a new stake in the game. Whereas, oh, well, in fact, starting in 1768 to 1771, you know, we have uh, this protest against unfair taxation policies. We have this protest against the British government. It culminates in a pitched war against, um, you know, the king's men in essence. And, you know, it, it, again, that's decontextualizing the event. That's playing into a very different use than reality, but I think it justifies a larger narrative tradition and it situates North Carolina as, as a, a forerunner in this revolutionary movement. I mean, the American Revolution is, is the event, of course, of the 18th century and becomes the commemorative event of the 19th century. And that's at least, I think, one thought that, you know, I would have as to, as to why writers appropriated it and refashioned it and refabricated it as they did. Um, and again, as you noted, though, it, it, it's a complete misreading. And it, it doesn't do good service to the event it, it, itself and it takes it out of its proper context. And then of course, as, as you and your viewers know, many of the regulars <laughs> become loyalists. Right. They themselves are, are on the other side during the, during the actual you know, events of the revolution. Not all, not all, but, but there are a significant number. Right, and then you know the many of the officers in the militia go on to fight in the Continental Army, and mm -hmm. so you know it it makes it particularly frustrating when you go to that stone monument uh, at Alamance Battleground, which was dedicated in 1880, and it says here was fought the Battle of Alamance between the British and the Regulators, and you say, okay, well then we really have a lot to unpack here uh, about how this paints the the battle, or, or any of the graphic depictions from the, the 19th century, early 20th century, and even dare I say, um, last year on uh, the television show Outlander, they were talking about Alamance being spark of the revolution and they had uh, part of the militia not not all of them but about half in redcoats you know which is of course the like the universal mark of bad guys is to put them in uh, in redcoats so yeah um in, can i unfairly turn the table please. and ask you a question oh please please so you know as site manager uh, you know i'm really interested in the community of landscape and so you know you Me have too. A law of obligations because you're interpreting you know a 1770 1771 site but then also you have this 19th century overlay you know what what strides or what attempts are you making as the site manager to try to perhaps contextualize that that monument and and you know how do you how do you talk about this to visitors it, it's very difficult, right? Because, um, well, for one, you have this very idiosyncratic movement and military conflict, the regulation that a lot of times people don't understand or, or have much knowledge of when they come, or they have, you know, some sort of, I guess, uh, incomplete understanding or an attempt to conflate it with the, the revolution. And that really is where the, the mind goes if you don't really know a lot about it and you first start hearing about it, 1771, you know, popular uprising, all this. So, um, uh, you know, myself and the staff have 
taken uh, a, a lot of care to make sure that interpretively, we always keep that at the forefront, establishing that this is before, this is a pre-revolutionary conflict and that there is this sort of, not switching of sides, but there's a jumbling of sides. Um, so we try to complicate that understanding of regulation as revolution. And, and we try to uh, first hit that just in our everyday interpretation. And then um, I, I sort of see the monuments at the battleground, because there's two of them, and both of them do say that Alamance is the first battle of the revolution. I take both of them as assets uh, because it gives us a perfect uh, way to talk about historical memory. Um, and the timing of it is interesting. One is in 1880, the other one is in 1901. Um, and I, I take both of those uh, to be times when uh, first North Carolina wanted to assert itself as you know home of the first battle of the, the revolution because superlatives never go out of style. But then also um, 1880, you're not that far removed from the Civil War and that, that reunification that takes place. Mm -hmm. And then in 1901, uh, you're just after the Spanish American War, this sort of, you know, great moment in reunification where North and South are, you know, fighting against a common enemy together. And I, I think they were trying to paint this picture of uh, the United States being better when everyone is being united and serving up the regulators as an example in this story. Um, but it really gives us a, an opportunity to unpack why you would put that up on the monument in the first place, what message you're trying to tell. And then we get to talk about you know, some other interesting things too, that um, monument that was um, uh, dedicated in 1901, it was moved to the battleground in the 50s. Uh, right. It was originally at Guilford Courthouse. So okay. that, that's got a really weird history, but mm -hmm. um, the, the person who gave the, um, uh, the, like invocation or the remarks for that dedication uh, was Charles Acock. And so we can talk about Acock uh, and Acock also talks about the regulators in uh, his uh, inaugural address. And he serves them up as an example yeah. of uh, people who stood up for their rights in the, the same way that white North Carolinians should stand up for their rights uh, against African-American rights. I mean, it, it is right there in the text. Um, he, he calls that out specifically. And uh, so, you know, the, the regulators have a very, um, a very long history where they get used for, you know, different reasons by different people. And that, that really has not stopped for 250 years. I think there is often a feeling among many historic sites that their obligations are too a specific time and a specific time only, and by so doing, serve sort of erase the commander of nature. And as far as I know, there's there's not a site in the United States that doesn't have this commemorative overlay. You know, all these sites have have monumentation. All of them have been shaped, in the case of the Civil War, by by the first veteran generation and by subsequent, um, you know, the War Department and the National Park Service. And and there are these very layered spaces. And I think you know being time specific is of paramount importance, 1771, 1770, but these other layers I think are absolutely fascinating and can just open up these really interesting stories. So I, I applaud you and I was just I was just curious. I haven't been to the site obviously in a long time. Um, we haven't been back to North Carolina in, in a good while. So I was sort of curious. I need to obviously go down after <laughs> things open back up, but. Yeah, it, it would be great to, to have you. And um, mm -hmm. we, we've, we've tried to expand our interpretation. Um, we have, yeah, in, in the time that you've been uh, in North Carolina, or since you've been away from North Carolina, we've acquired about, uh, about 60 acres of new land. Uh, some mm -hmm. of it we think is of significance to the battle and mm -hmm. um, uh, have, have done more to try to contextualize it. So, yeah. mm -hmm. um, so okay, kind of, wrapping this all up, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to get historians together to talk about this is because it is the 250th anniversary. And um, we have, we are afforded this moment to kind of look back and, and ponder the regulator movement and the battle. And, you know, either in, in your own work as a historian, your, your work on your thesis, you know, what lessons do you think the story of the regulator movement has for us today? Um, what are the things that you consider when you think about the regulator movement now in 2021? 
Yeah, and I guess I'll, I'll keep this you know, relatively broad, but that first concept that we talked about, or at least an early concept that we talked about of, of simply misunderstanding, right? <laughs> that, that I think people often have points of view and, and there's this unwillingness to listen. I know that might sound sort of simplistic to boil down this very complicated political contest over all sorts of um, complicated issues, but, but, but nonetheless, um, you know, why is it that this war of words has escalated to a pitched battle in, in the Piedmont of North Carolina and in, in which there's this loss of life? It, you know, the second part, the road to Alamance is this, uh, the riot act, you know, this, this application of force and, and again, this turn, turn to violence. Um, you know, again, how does a, a, a peaceful protest devolve into, again, a, a pitched battle? Um, so, I mean, I think those are some, some broad thoughts. I think getting it sort of rooted in place is the importance of place. I mean, you know, you and I, and, and I'm sure many of your audience are, are, are preservationists at heart. You know, you're in an area that has, has rapid growth. The Piedmont has changed dramatically. My father went to NC State back in the 70s. Um, I took him back to Raleigh uh, probably 10 years ago. And you know, and I'm not saying we shouldn't have growth. I get it, but you know, how can we thoughtfully maintain a balance in you know smart development, but also the maintenance of these landscapes, these historic landscapes that are so central. I mean, this story wouldn't have had really any meaning to me if Hillsborough wasn't sort of the small quaint town that it remains today. And granted, it too has grown, but sort of I think grown in a very smart, systematic way. The fact that Alamance itself was preserved, again, one of the early sites that I went to, really stresses that we, we have these, these landscapes that are integral to our understanding and that they must be preserved and they must be interpreted in meaningful ways. And I think that bleeds into the final point here is that you do have these layered stories. And you know, in the span of, of your brief answer, you took us from uh, you know, a political protest of the 1770s through a reaction to desegregation in the 1950s, all of that can be, re, you know, sort of rehearsed and and and, and discussed at, at this one historic site. That's quite incredible. I mean, you know, that's that is a distillation of several phases of North Carolina's history. Um, sorry, it's even longer than that, going from the the pre-revolutionary era to the period of reconciliation, you know, quote unquote reconciliation. To the period of desegregation, and you know, I, I'm just compelled by these stories. Um, you know, I, I have an academic appointment, obviously, but I think at my heart, I still very much like to think of myself as a public historian. I don't know if I do it that well, but whenever I have opportunities to work with audiences, you know, it's these stories that compel me so much. And and, and so, um, I think that there is an obligation to, to to tell sometimes uncomfortable stories and to create these layered narratives. And that's not exactly going back to the regular movement, but I think you offered us an example of how we can do that. Yeah, I th well, I think that I think that's evergreen. I, I think that's really important for anybody who's doing historical work. Um, right. You know, being being comfortable with complicated history and and uncomfortable history sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, Jim, thank you so much for joining yeah, me today. Uh, really enjoyed speaking with you. Um, yeah, if you uh, want to find his <laughs> thesis on UNCG's website, um, I'm not going to read the title, um, but it's out there. Uh, <laughs> but I would highly recommend uh, his book from 2019, Private Confederacies uh, from UNC Press. Uh, Jim, thank you again. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, Jeremiah. And thanks for the walk down memory lane. It was a, it was <laughs> a good visit. Yeah, thank you.